Has this ever happened to you or maybe someone that you know? You are going to a church, and it's a church that you love. You love the people, you love the pastor, you believe the pastor teaches good, sound theology, good, sound doctrine, you enjoy it. But as you start to learn and as you start to grow more and more in the image of Christ, you notice that the music that you have been singing inside that church does not represent or reflect the values of what your church is teaching and what you believe the Bible is teaching. If this is you, you're not alone. So many Christians have gone through this issue where they are a part of a church that they love and they enjoy to be a part of, but yet when it comes to the music, the church chooses to sing popular songs that are not biblically sound, whether it would be in the lyrics or the source that it's coming from. That's the topic that we're gonna be discussing today on I Believe. Now what? Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of I Believe Now What? If this is your first time here, we are a show that is just geared towards glorifying God by talking about that now what that comes after we believe. And one of those topics is going to be church and more specifically, just like we talked about in the introduction of this video, the music when we worship in church. Now this topic for the video actually came about from a commenter who left a comment on a previous video talking about the dilemma that they are in where they go to a church that they love. They love the pastor, they love the people, they love the teaching, but yet as they started to grow more and more into the image of Christ and reading their Bible more and then discovering that the songs that they were singing, either number one, were lyrically bad, or number two, coming from a bad source, or even worse, number three, all of together at the same time. And I know from my personal experience in my job, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know I am active duty military. I travel around a lot. I have to move every three years. And in that, I'm always searching for churches. And believe me, this comes across more often than not. I go to a church, they usually start off with the praise and worship music, and they play the same songs that many people are now today finding issues with because they're coming from either unbiblical sources or have unbiblical lyrics. I sit through the teaching, I sit through the preaching, and lo and behold, the teaching and preaching is actually pretty solid. So why is this so much of an issue for churches that are having great sound teaching, great sound preaching, they got members in the church that love God, but yet they are singing psalms from places that are the complete opposite of that and perpetuate false theology, false doctrine and rather just come from a corrupt source and it doesn't take much digging to find these things out all it takes is a quick google search of either the artist or the lyrics themselves to see this so why is this so much of an issue and that's exactly what we're going to be going over today in today's episode now before we really break into the meat and potatoes of this i want to lay this down on a biblical foundation about number one why music is actually very important when it comes to our worship, and number two, why sound teaching is also important when it comes to our worship. For the music portion, there's a lot of different passages that we can look to, but I want to read to you Psalm 150, and it reads, Psalm 150, verses 1 through 6, Praise the Lord! Praise God in His sanctuary! Praise Him in His mighty expanse! Praise Him for His mighty deeds! Praise Him according to His excellent greatness! Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with tremble and dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We can just see how important music and instruments and singing is when it comes to our worship of God. Now for sound teaching, I want to take you to the book of Titus. If you didn't know, Titus is a great book when it comes to learning about church, uh, just along right up there with uh, First and Second Timothy, because these were letters that Paul wrote to Titus and wrote to Timothy when it came to pretty much running a church. That's why so many good churches read these books when it comes to setting up their churches, setting up rules and other various things when it comes to teaching and doctrine and things like that. Titus chapter 2, verses 7 through 8 reads, 
In all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. That, that means, in other words, nobody can really point a finger at you saying, no, you're bad. I seen what you did on Saturday night at the bars over there, and you're up there preaching on Sunday. Uh, but sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. This verse once again emphasizes the importance of purity in doctrine and sound teaching, which is why leaders in the church need to make sure that they are, number one, practicing what they preach, and number two, really probably should be number one, teaching the correct things. So for our first topic, I want to go over the role of worship music in church. And this is something that honestly, I've seen a lot of people kind of make the mistake of, and I think it's because of the way we label things. Oftentimes when we think of worship, our mind automatically goes to the music. When in reality, worship is not just music. Worship is when you go to church, when you're talking to fellow brothers and sisters about God before the service starts, when the pastor is preaching the message after church, when you're discussing what the pastor just talked about, when you're praying, all of this is worship to include the music that we sing. It's not only the music that we sing. All of it is wrapped up into what worship is. Now, the first thing I want to mention is that worship music has this amazing ability to highlight and really enhance our worship when we are worshiping God. And the reason why is because music does something that just talking cannot do. Music can bring about emotions. Music can bring about feelings and things of that nature. And this can either, number one, work for our worship of God or number two, the bad part, work against our worship of God. Emotions in its of itself are not a bad thing. Sometimes they gets that label from maybe more reform circles that emotions are bad, don't show them. And then you have the more hyper charismatic side of things where they're going, no, you got to show emotion every single time. We need to figure out a way to create emotion, you know, and in reality, Emotion is not bad or good in of itself, but it's rather what is it being directed to. For the more reform side, it is absolutely appropriate when worshiping God to sing or to shout or to dance or to do these different things. And then for the more charismatic side, you can't just worship any single way that you decide to do it. You have to do it the way God prescribed to do it, which is something we're going to get into actually a little bit later on in the video. But worshiping with our emotions emotions is not a bad thing. What we need to make sure that we're doing is that we are enhancing our worship with our emotions in sound biblical doctrine, theology, in our worship of God. We can't just be worshiping willy-nilly however way that we decide is best in our own eyes. This is how we got this problem of having these psalms and these churches that don't care really so much about the lyrics, that don't care so much about sound teaching, but rather just want to offer you an experience experience with God or something of that nature. One of the beautiful things about music in our worship is it can reinforce the solid teachings of the Bible. I don't know about you, but there are some psalms out there that just sing amazing biblical truths that just bring a tear to your eye and just want you to fall down on your knees, lift your hands up, and just thank God for his amazing grace, for his amazing everything, power, might, everything for what he has done for us in our lives, and not only that, but just how amazing he is, period. Worship music can definitely enhance our worship of God when it is backed up by sound biblical truths. But once again, it's when that music is doing the same thing, eliciting those emotions, bringing about that feeling or experience, but it's not based on sound biblical doctrine. It's either based on unsound, unbiblical teaching, or an unbiblical source that it is coming from. Sadly, some people take way too loosely the worship of God. I have literally had someone tell me that they can praise and worship God with an ACDC psalm just as much as they could with a biblical him, and it's all dependent on how they're viewing it in their heart. And while that may sound good on paper, that's not actually how the Bible describes this. When it comes to the worship of God, 
God is very, very serious when it comes to how it's done. If left to our own devices, we would be worshiping God in unbiblical ways, and we can see examples of that all throughout the Bible. And I just want to give you a few examples of times in the Bible where people were trying to worship God based upon their own understanding rather than the way that God was describing it. First, I want to take you to Genesis chapter 4, and this is Cain and Abel. If you remember this, Cain and Abel were offering sacrifices to God. Cain offered the fruit of his labor, literally the harvest of his crops, the work that he had done in the fields in order to grow these crops and presented these to God, while Abel presented the first of his flock. He offered a blood sacrifice to God. God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he rejected Abel. Cain's. Now, why do you think that is? Well, we can go on in a whole different topic of this as a foreshadowing of Christ, but regardless of that, God rejected Cain's sacrifice. Cain, instead of doing the right thing, which is following the example of the accepted sacrifice of his brother, and in fact, God even told him, why, why are you like this? Just do what is right and everything will be okay, paraphrasing obviously. But basically, that's what God told him. And instead of Cain repenting and saying, okay, I'm going to follow the example of my brother Abel and give you a sacrifice that you want, he got mad, he got jealous, he got filled with pride and ended up killing his brother in that process. While I'm sure Cain probably had the best of intentions in offering a sacrifice to God, it was not pleasing to God. That shows that we can't just worship God in any willy-nilly way that we see fit. We have to do it the way God prescribes. Another example, go to Leviticus 10, where we see Aaron's sons offering this strange fire to God. And just to give you a little context, God was very specific on how the sacrifice, the burnt offerings, the incense, all this stuff was supposed to be done. Aaron's sons ended up offering God something other than he prescribed, and they were killed because of it. Now, praise the Lord that he does not do that anymore, because I bet there would be a lot less Christians walking around, and praise the Lord for his grace. But nevertheless, it shows that God was very serious on how he takes worship. You either do it the way I prescribe, or I am not going to accept it. It is a strange fire to God. Next, you can look at 1 Samuel chapter 13, where King Saul was offering a sacrifice to God, not in a prescribed manner. That was not his role. He was not the one to be doing that. It was supposed to be Samuel who was doing it. But nevertheless, he decided to go ahead and do it on his own, and it was not pleasing to the Lord at all. If you want some New Testament examples, you can look at the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, where the Pharisees were offering sacrifices to God and worshiping God in their own way. As Jesus said, they honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him because they wanted to do things their way and the way that they sought best in their own eyes, their own judgment, and their own understanding. And while there's a lot more examples that we can go over, I'll leave you with this as the last one. Go look at the church in Corinth, and this is more relevant to the modern day church today, a church that had spiritual gifts but was misusing them or misrepresenting them and not using them for what they were actually intended for, but instead they were so obsessed with spiritual gifts and they were so obsessed with the supernatural that Paul had to go in there and write them a letter of correction, even telling them at one point in time in 2 Corinthians, hey, you guys need to examine yourselves to make sure that you are of the faith because you're all zealous for these spiritual gifts, you're all crazy about these things, but when it comes to your actions and when it comes to what you're actually doing, it's not lining up with what you say you believe. You need to check yourself before you wreck yourself, essentially. Once again, that's a paraphrase. In all these examples that we went over, these were people who were trying to worship God based upon their own understanding, their own terms, their own mind, and not doing it the way that God specifically prescribed it. And sadly, this is the same thing that we see in so many modern churches today. They'll tell you, oh, it doesn't matter about the lyrics. Literally, I had a pastor one time who was playing an unbiblical psalm. I refused to sing it. I sat down and he got up on stage and looked right at me saying, it doesn't matter what the lyrics say. Just sing a new psalm to the Lord. <sighs> I tell you what, my heart goes out because I love that pastor. I love him so much. I still love him to this day. 
but he was dead wrong. The lyrics matter. The words matter. The source that those lyrics are coming from matters because it matters not just to me or somebody else in the congregation. It matters to God. Time and time again, we can look all over the Bible of multiple occasions where people were checking all the blocks when it came to worship, but because they either weren't living their lives the right way or they weren't doing things the way that God said to actually do them, God rejected that worship. Just like God told Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Do what is is right. Do it the way God intended us to do it, with a pure heart coming from pure intentions and a pure way of following him. So now that we've gone over the biblical reasons why worshiping God needs to be done in a way that is not only coming from us in a pure way, but also the way that God has prescribed it, let's go ahead and look at some examples that many churches are using today in their praise and worship sessions, the music part of their worship, that are honestly either number one, unbiblical, number two, coming from a bad source, or number three, guilty of both. So just a little admin data, this list does not include old psalms that are found in most hymnals today because honestly, those are psalms that are copyright free. It's hard to actually get hard data on those because, you know, you don't need to go ahead and put down every single time you sing that. So what we're going to do is actually look at the top copyright licensed Christian praise and worship psalms since those are really the easiest to track down with hard data. And what we're going to see is that a majority of these psalms from the top 100 are either coming from heretical churches, they have heretical lyrics, or they're guilty of both, as we said earlier. And while I don't have the time to explain every single psalm in the top 100, I'll give you a few examples from the top 10. So the number one psalm, according to the CCLI, that's the site that I'm using to track these copyright license praise and worship psalms, the number one psalm that is sung in churches across the the world is going to be The Goodness of God by Bethel Music. Maybe you are familiar with this and I would play it for you if I could, but I'd probably get a copyright strike on this and they'll take my video down. But basically, while the lyrics of this psalm are honestly, if you go through and research them, they're not horrible. You can say they're kind of, you know, surface level or whatever the case may be. The lyrics themselves are not the worst and maybe I'll catch some hate for that. But you need to remember this saying I'm about to tell you. Even if the fruit looks appetizing, looks pretty, if the root is bad, it's going to produce a bad fruit. And as soon as you bite into that fruit, you are fully supporting everything that that root has pushed out. So maybe some of you are going, well, hey, Tim, what's wrong with Bethel music? Well, let me just give you a few examples. Now, if you did not know, Bethel is probably the leader of the new apostolic reformation. If you don't know what that is, it's commonly referred to as the NAR, but that is essentially churches who are a obsessed with the supernatural. They're obsessed with signs and wonders gifts. They're obsessed with all these strange doctrines that tickle ears. That's essentially what they propagate. And you might ask, okay, well, what's specifically wrong with them, Tim? One of the biggest issues that I have heard Bill Johnson, their lead pastor, say is denying the deity of Jesus Christ when he performs his miracles. I'm so glad that Jesus did what he did on the pages of Scripture. But do you understand, he didn't heal anybody as God. He did no miracles as God. Everything he did, he did as man in right relationship with God. The reason why he denies the deity of Christ when performing miracles is because that does not fit in with the Bethel theology of believing that we can do the exact same things that Jesus did. That's raising people from the dead, healing the sick, the blind, whatever the case may be. He literally believes that Christians should never ever get sick because that is against the will of God. Does God ever choose not to heal? No. Not only that, but all you got to do is Google the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry to go ahead and get a good idea of what these people believe. And honestly, it is very disturbing and crazy. <laughs> And 
And just to leave you off with this, I'll leave you with a clip of Jen Johnson describing the Holy Spirit. And Jen Johnson is the person who actually partially wrote this psalm. And the Holy Spirit to me is like the genie from Aladdin. That's who he is to me. And he's funny. He's sneaky. He's silly. If this isn't enough to make you see that this is an incorrect church with incorrect teachings and that you should not be singing any of their psalms, I don't know what else will. Next psalm we'll go over is the number four psalm on this chart, according to CCLI, and that is going to be a psalm by Elevation Worship called Graves into Gardens. Once again, this is an example of a psalm, but while the lyrics themselves are not completely unbiblical, and they're probably very, very shallow at best, but nevertheless, they're not unbiblical biblical it's coming from a very bad source. While I personally may not place Elevation Church on that same level that I would put Bethel and Hillsong and Transformation and some of these other churches like that, they're nevertheless a very bad church that you should not be listening to, you should not be going to, and you should not be enjoying the music that they produce, simply for the reason that they have so many things wrong with them. One of the biggest is with their lead pastor, Stephen Furtick. Now, if you never heard of him, Stephen Furtick is a person who is really kind of described as a narcissist. If you watch interviews from people who have worked at Elevation Church talking about the way that he yells at people for not getting correct camera angles of him and taking certain photographs of him. My basically my biggest thing from him was I he was always like very me centered. Um, he always focused on how do, I, like, how do I look on stage? How does the camera look when I'm on stage? And there's certain angles and spots like where you're told to like to take photos of him. There's like a special angle like you have to be in to get like a good shot of like his side profile because otherwise he wouldn't want to post it. The man literally wears almost a different outfit every single Sunday and those outfits cost almost as much as people make on a bi-weekly basis. I looked at my paycheck compared to his outfits. I wouldn't be able to afford that. So maybe you're thinking, okay, well, Tim, maybe he's a little bit of a narcissist. Maybe he spends a lot of money on his clothes. What does that mean? Why does that make him a heretic in his preaching and teaching? One of the biggest things is his belief in modalism. And while he may not exactly say those words, if you just watch some teachings where he's describing the Holy Spirit, it's clear that he believes in modalism, which is essentially essentially denying the Trinity, denying the three persons of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, and believing that Christ is really all three of those. So the common analogy with modalism goes like this, that you believe that Jesus is like water. He can be liquid, he can be vapor, or he can be a solid, but never all three at the same time. And now Jesus is taken from their sight and hidden in a cloud, but he did not leave. He just changed forms. The Trinity has always been a solid foundation ever since the establishment of the church back in the New Testament. The belief that God is three in one through the Father, Son, and Spirit, and those who deny deny that are really on the outside looking in, in my opinion. Couple that with the fact that Furtick is known for his famous one-liners that are often really bad. I am God Almighty! It's crazy. I, I, I just don't know how people can continue listening to him when all this is going on. And not to mention the fact that their worship band, Elevation Worship, the worship band of that church, has been known to charge thousands of dollars for seats at their concert tours. Who is going to charge thousands of dollars to watch someone sing praise and worship songs? Isn't the worship of God supposed to be something free? And trust me, I get it. It costs money to go ahead and go on tour and bring these events to different people, so I'm not discounting that. But do you have to charge thousands of dollars in order to get a front row worship experience for people? It's nuts. And, and it's honestly unbiblical and not right. Next, I'll jump down to the number six most popular worship song according to CCLI Sunland Churches, and that is Hillsong United's What a Beautiful Name, or in other words, I think they call themselves Hillsong Worship. They have so many 
different uh, names going out there for all their psalms, so I can't really keep track, but it's Hill Psalm. This is a good example of something that is both bad in lyrics and bad in content. You have to have been living under a rock if you are a Christian and you do not know about all the atrocities that are coming out about Hillsong, whether it's pastors exposing themselves to girls, pastors who are getting in affairs. GMA cover story, Carl Lentz was a prominent pastor at Hillsong Church until he was fired after he admitted to an affair. Now, pastors who are stealing the tithe money from their churches, pastors who are wandering into hotel rooms, drunk with ladies that are not their wives. These are things that are coming out about Hillsong and it's just showing you how corrupt they really are. Not to mention the fact that they are a proponent of the prosperity gospel. They believe that you have to be rich, that you should be financially secure in God and God is going to make you healthy and wealthy. There's not one person in this building who doesn't need more money. This is all stuff that is honestly wrong and not biblical. I wonder if you told the Apostle Paul that God wants you to be rich, healthy, and wealthy, what he would have to say about that. Because just looking at his life, according to the Bible, it was anything but that. But I tell you what, I'm sure he's enjoying glory right now. As my neighbor recently said to me, while the uh, earthly benefits aren't that good, the retirement benefits are out of this world when it comes to actually being a faithful preacher and teacher. What a... Now, unlike a lot of the other examples that we talked about, it's not just the church that this song is coming from, but this case, for what a beautiful name it is, it is also the lyrics themselves that are bad. And when you look at the lyrics as a whole, for the most part, you'll read through and you'll go, well, what's so bad about that, Tim? These are you know, pretty decent lyrics. They're solid, once again, a little shallow, a little superficial. Uh, but nevertheless, they're, they're not unbiblical. Until you get to the line that says, you didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. This is an untrue statement. Number one, this statement makes it sound as if God needs us and he couldn't exist without us. So in order to be happy, he had to bring heaven down in order to share a life with us, which is not true. God does not need anything. He is self-sufficient. He is self-sustaining. He does not require our presence. He alone can sustain himself. It is by his grace that he has decided to allow us to enter into his presence when that time comes for us to be in glory. And also the fact that when they say brought heaven down, that hasn't happened yet. This is something that will happen in the future when the new heavens and the new earth is created. And I understand that they are probably trying to draw an analogy saying that Jesus, when he came down, he is heaven and he came down and brought it. Regardless of what you say and how you defend it, it's a very poor analogy. And it just shows that they're not taking the time and care in writing these lyrics to make sure that they are backed up by biblical truth. Now, while there are plenty of more examples that we can go over, this entire video would just be saturated and become multiple hours long just going over them. So we're going to go ahead and pump the brakes. But I think you get the idea. There are a lot of churches today that are singing psalms that come from unbiblical churches, and these psalms sometimes have unbiblical lyrics. And referencing back to what we talked about in the very beginning, God is serious when it comes to his prescribed form of worship. Jesus said in John chapter 3 to the woman at the well that there will become a time where we will worship in spirit and and truth. This is worship acceptable to God in spirit, as in our spirit, and in truth. That is the truth that is found in the Bible, the truth that is found in the biblical doctrines laid out throughout the Bible. When we compromise in any of those issues, then we are providing false worship that is not going to be accepted by God. I one time had someone tell me that it doesn't matter how you worship. God accepts all forms of worship. Obviously, from the biblical examples that we read, that is not the case. Now, lastly, before we move on, I want to address one last thing. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, hey, Tim, I get it. The church is bad. But the Psalms, you literally said the lyrics of the Psalms are not bad. How about I sing the Psalms, but I'm just not acknowledging that church. What is the difference there? And in theory, that does sound good. But when you actually look into it and do the research, you will find out that every time your church sings those songs inside their church services, every time they sing their songs at youth gatherings or concerts or venues or whatever the case may be, 
Okay, so hold up real quick because I don't want my words to get mixed up. Churches, when they sing praise and worship songs in their actual church service, I'm talking about their normal Sunday morning church service, they technically actually don't have to pay anything because they're covered under a copyright rule. But what does actually happen, if you want to play that song, either in your lobby, you want to perform it at something as youth events, or maybe a revival, or anything outside the normal normal scope of Sunday worship, you have to pay them. Not only that, if you want to use their words on overhead projectors, PowerPoint presentations, whatever the case may be, distribute the lyrics so people can sing them, you also have to pay them. So I just wanted to clear that up to make sure it's 100% clear and my words don't get twisted. Those bad churches are making money off you using their songs. This topic honestly deserves a video of its own because you can really deep dive. And trust me, I spent hours deep diving this for preparation of this video. But I'm just going to go ahead and leave it at this. If your church is projecting those lyrics onto a screen, if your church is printing lyrics and passing them out in a pamphlet, if your church is playing this at youth events or any other events that they're doing, and your church is obeying the law, then your church is giving money to these bad churches in that process. Now, I want to be clear, there are some nuances when it comes to that, but that's once again for another topic where we can dive more into the CCLI and CCA agreements when it comes to Christian worship music licensing for churches. Now that we've laid a biblical foundation, we've talked about why it's so important to worship God in spirit and truth as prescribed by the Bible. We gave some examples of some bad churches and some bad psalms that churches are continuing to sing in their worship service today. I want to talk about actually addressing this dilemma. And this is specifically for that person who wrote me in the comments section and for anybody else out there who may be dealing with this issue. I want to offer some potential solutions to this problem. As we often say in the army, don't come to me with problems unless you have some solutions. So we brought up the problem, we addressed it, we showed why it's an issue, why it's a problem, and now I want to talk about those possible solutions that churches and congregations can both use in this dilemma. So solution number one, Worship pastors, worship leaders, do your job. Do the research into the Psalms. And by doing that, I'm not talking about just reading the lyrics. That is very important. You need to read the lyrics of every single Psalm that you're going to sing and study them intently, but also look up the sources where these Psalms are coming from. This is literally part of your job as a worship leader if you are part of a solid church. It's not just singing what the pastor tells you to do, but rather research searching, doing this, using the Bible to make sure that not only the lyrics are solid, but the source that it's coming from is solid. Do the research. But not only that, pray to God throughout that entire process of researching the lyrics, researching the church, because you want to make sure that you are in lock and step with the Holy Spirit during that. Number two, and this is for the congregations, do your own research. Don't just sit there and assume that every single psalm the church is pumping out is going to be a good God. God glorifying psalm. Do your own research on it the same way that pastors do. I get it. We don't have the same time. This isn't our actual job to do this. But if you take your worship seriously, it doesn't take long to get on the internet with all the resources we have today to ensure that you are listening and singing songs that are glorifying to God. And listening, that's another key thing right there, because if you didn't know, maybe you can go back to that whole situation of, well, the lyrics are good, but the church is bad, but, you know, that doesn't really matter. I just like singing that song and listening to that song. Well, every single time you stream that song on YouTube, every single time you play that song either on Spotify or iTunes or whatever you like to listen to music to, royalty money is going to that church. So yes, you are supporting that bad church and their bad doctrine when you are doing this. Suggestion number three, and this is for the church again, sing some tried and tested hymns. Yes, these songs have been around forever, and maybe you may think they're boring and they're not as fun as, you know, new contemporary worship songs, but throw your own little flair on it if you want to. You don't have to sing it the exact same way in the same musical style that they did. I definitely leave the lyrics alone, 
but I would, you know, maybe spice it up. I know the church that I go to today, they often do this. They love throwing in some hymns every now and again into their praise and worship sessions, and they will do so with a little bit of a modern flair to it. They'll, you know, update the psalm musically. I am not the most musically inclined person, so I won't really comment on all the intricacies that go with that, but, you know, they do a pretty good job with it. So don't be afraid to go back to some tried and tested hymns that have withstood the test of time. But also, mind you, for worship leaders, don't just assume because it is an old hymn that it is lyrically solid or coming from a solid source. You need to still do your research on that as well. And lastly, number four, and this is honestly a direction that I wish so many churches would start going towards, create your own music. If you are a worship leader, especially a worship leader where you are a part of a church that can afford to bring you on full-time as a full-time paid role, why not create your own praise and worship songs to God? Get with the worship team, come up with some biblically sound lyrics, come up with some good songs and sing that out loud. Then you don't have to worry about copyright laws. You don't have to worry about it coming from a corrupt source and you don't have to worry about the lyrics being potentially unbiblical. You can do this all on your own. Now with all these suggestions that I gave, there are gonna be some challenges along the way and I will address that here shortly, but I do want to give you just a couple of examples of artists that I enjoy listening to that I have personally researched on my own. And while my research may not be perfect, feel free to let me know anything about them in the comments. These are some solid praise and worship singers, bands, whatever you want to call them that I listen to and have researched in the past that I can suggest for your church to use in your worship sessions. Bands such as Sovereign Grace Music, City of Light, Keith and Kristen Getty, Shane and Shane, although recently they have gotten in a little bit of hot water because they decided to share a stage with Bethel at an Air One concert, which if you want to know my feelings about Air One, I'll make another video on that sometime later. Uh, Matt Boswell, Matt Papa, The Modern Post. I'm not sure if they make music anymore or not. Uh, and Elisa Childress, who we mentioned before. These are all good, solid praise and worship singers, bands, whatever you want to call them. So now that we've given examples and we talked about some potential solutions to the problem, I do want to talk about some difficulties that may come inside your church when you try to act on some of these solutions. Number one, people may not know the lyrics to the songs. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure it's awkward when you are a praise and worship leader and you're up there singing a song and everyone in the congregation is just kind of reading the lyrics because they never heard this song before. And I understand that. At the same time, you can let them know ahead of time. There's nothing that says you can't do that. Hey, this is a new psalm or a new psalm that we wrote and we're going to continue singing it more and more. So we're going to go ahead and sing it once over with you guys. And we invite you to sing when you think you get it. But we'll keep continually doing this every so often on Sundays. So that way you can get used to this psalm. People are introduced to new psalms all the time. And it's always going to take time for them to learn these psalms. So that is really just a temporary setback. Another potential challenge that you may have when issuing out these changes inside your church is the fact that there will be some people that decide to leave your church. And this is really one of the sad facts, but at the same time, it is something that you need to be prepared for as a church. Sadly, I have read plenty of blog posts of people saying, hey, I'm looking for a church in my area that plays music similar to Hillsong or Elevation or Maverick City or whatever the case may be. They didn't really care about the teaching. They were literally only looking for that music experience. And maybe that's not fair of me to say that they don't care about the teaching, but you saw where their priority was. Whenever I am searching for a church, my first priority isn't to go, what songs are they singing? It's to go, what are they teaching? And then I go ahead and look and evaluate what songs they're singing and who they're singing them by. I'm not saying it's not important, it's just not my number one priority when looking for a new church. But sadly, so many people people go to churches simply because they're looking for that worship experience that does it give them the goosebumps does it make them 
feel as if the Holy Spirit is in this room right now. And sadly, there are so many of these unbiblical churches that make this music that provide that experience for them. It ultimately goes back to people seeking signs and experiences over the Savior. Last challenge, and I'm sure there's multiple more that we could go over, but the most glaring one to me could be the potentiality that you're going to need to be prepared to answer questions when people in your congregation come up to you and ask, ask, hey, how come we're not singing these psalms anymore? Hey, how come we're not singing this new Hillsong song or new Elevation Worship song? And you need to be prepared as a pastor, as a worship leader, as an elder, as a deacon, to explain why we are not singing these psalms and why it is not biblically right to sing these psalms from these churches have an answer. Now that we focused on some of the challenges, I want to explain to you the benefits of making these changes in your church. One glaring one is that you are really going to do a great job of honestly weeding out the wheat and tares inside that church. People, like I said, who are more superficial and only there for a worship experience will probably fall away and leave. But in the best case scenario, their eyes are open to the truth and they get learned in sound biblical doctrine and they'll stay in the church and they'll want to learn more and more and more about God coming to a real truth, knowledge, salvation about a worship, a real worship experience, not some superficially, emotionally driven one. Another benefit is the edification of the church. The church is learning so much through the theology of the Psalms. And honestly, Psalms in themselves can be sermons. They are just wrapped up in biblical truths and based on biblical passages. And they just honestly can edify the mind and the spirit all at the same time when we are offering our worship with God. And lastly, and there's once again probably multiple benefits to this that I'm not mentioning, but the number one benefit that I see coming out of making these changes is you are worshiping God as a church in a God glorifying way. Now that we've gone over that, I want to go over our really, I guess, point number five, I believe this would be. And what can you do as someone in a congregation if you are in this situation? That's really the entire reason why we made this video. What can you do as someone inside a church that may be in this dilemma of a church that is filled with sound teaching when it comes to the sermon, when it comes to the pastor, when it comes to the congregation for the most part, but not when it comes to the praise and worship psalms being sung? Well, the first thing that you can do as a member of a congregation, really the best thing that you can do, is bring this up to the pastor. Bring it up to the elders. Bring it up to the staff. Let the church know where you are on this issue. And when you do this, make sure you're not going to do it on a random Sunday morning when you hear a psalm that you don't like because nothing really gets done through those, but instead try to set up a meeting with the pastor, set up a meeting with the worship leader, ask them for some time because you have real concerns that you want to get addressed. And when you go there, don't come unprepared, have all the biblical reasons laid out why you believe your church is not honoring God through their praise and worship music. Have all the reasons listed out, have the Bible verses ready to go to go back and reference. And if that pastor is truly someone who is working in the spirit and convicted and truly called to be a leader inside that church, there is no reason in my mind why I believe that pastor would just totally ignore you. Sure, they might be abrasive at first, they may have some good counter arguments, but if you are standing on biblical truths and that pastor is a biblical pastor, they will eventually come to realize that they are not correct and come back and say, hey, I thought about it and you're right. Honestly, you would be surprised how many issues can get solved by this inside of a church instead of either, number one, just complaining randomly on a Sunday, or number two, just straight up leaving a church, because that's the last thing that you want to do. If you actually care about the church, the people in the church, the pastor, you love them and you care about them, don't just leave. Let them know what the issues are. I remember there was a church I was once attending, and I had an issue that was really a make-or-break issue for me with this church. It was something that I had not previously even thought this church endorsed, and when it was brought up, I was at the 
the point where I was ready to leave that church. But before doing that, I set up a meeting with that pastor. I got myself ready. I had my biblical examples ready to go. And when I sat down with that pastor, before anything was ever said, he came back and said, Tim, I researched what you're talking about. And honestly, I was wrong. We weren't honoring God this way, and thank you for bringing that up. And we had an amazing iron sharpens iron conversation after that. And that just speaks to what happens when you are actually in a biblical church with a biblical pastor who will listen to sound reasoning. Now, as we start ready to close this video out, and I know it's been a long one, so I appreciate anybody who stuck it all the way through, especially those who may be offended by this, I appreciate that you sat down and listened to what I had to say regarding this topic and really what the Bible has to say regarding this topic. Because I'm not trying to form any opinions of my own, but rather looking to the Bible and searching before I formulate my own ideas and opinions on this. One key thing that I think I failed to mention throughout the entire process of this video, now that I'm looking back on it, is how you present this. And I kind of touched up on it in this last segment that we talked about when going in front of your pastor, going in front of your church leaders, elders, whoever it is you bring this issue to, you want to make sure you're doing it in a way that is honoring to God. So often, people, when they have an issue inside the church, are just heated and ready to go. They put their boxing gloves on and they go, oh, I'm going to one-two you with the scriptures and blah, blah, blah. Come with a humble heart. Come with a learning heart and come with an understanding heart and reach together the answer to the problem. Don't just automatically go in there swinging with your big old right haymaker. Come from a humble stance when presenting these issues and biblical truths that you are concerned about. So in closing, if you have any thoughts, opinions, anything like that of your own on this idea or topic, I please put it in the comments. I read pretty much every single comment that gets put on every single video, mostly because, you know, we're not that big of a YouTube channel, so I'm able to actually do that. But at the same time, I will still, even if this channel were to blow up, you know, by the grace of God and get more messages out there, I would still make it a point to try to go through and read every single comment that people have because honestly, it's important to me. And maybe you'll bring something to my eyes that I have not seen before and something that I can address later on. And just like the whole reason why this video is being made is because somebody made a comment about an issue that was important to them. If you have an issue that's similar to this topic, or maybe it's completely unrelated, by all means, drop it in the comments, not only for the edification of other people, but for the edification of myself, which will eventually get turned into a video if it's something that it is very important for the church to know about. And when I say church for that, I'm not talking about just the physical building, but I'm talking about that invisible body of Christ, the real church, the members, the believers, the Christian. So once again, thank you for watching this all the way through. I highly encourage you if this was helpful to like share and subscribe this video and if you didn't like it by all means drop a comment and tell me why you did not like it so much <laughs> because as i said i read through everything and honestly i am not infallible i am not perfect i could be wrong but the number one thing that I always want to make sure that I am doing is going back to the Bible and doing my own research on this, just as I encourage you to go back to the Bible and do your own research on this before formulating an answer. Don't just take my word for it. Go back to the Bible. By all means, once again, thank you. Like, share, subscribe, all that typical YouTube jazz. I will talk to y'all later and see you on the next one.